Welcome everybody. This is a special Zoom meeting of the China Society of Southern California and the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. I'm Bob Lee, the president of the China Society. This program is being recorded. If you have questions during the program, please enter them on the Q&A and we'll try to get them answered um, after um, the program. Um, Our speaker, Stephen Little, is the Florence and Harry Sloan Curator of Chinese Art at LACMA. I hope he will forgive me for not listing his many positions and accomplishments that he has had. I want to go right to what matters most to me. Stephen has a wonderful talent for doing special exhibits of art. I first met Stephen in 1994. There was a snuff bottle convention in Honolulu with a special exhibit of inside painted snuff bottles that belonged to my friend, Joey Silver. Most people are fascinated by the paintings inside these tiny bottles. It's a real curiosity, but sometimes it's only treated as a curiosity. Stephen with his background in Chinese paintings was able to relate the paintings inside the bottles to the grand scheme of Chinese painting. Inside painted snuff bottles were more than just a curiosity. They were an extension of Chinese paintings and a great art form. During Stephen's time at LACMA, he has brought many special exhibits of Oriental art to LACMA. I think there have been more special exhibits during his tenure than I can remember during the many years prior to his coming. Often these include a symposium and or a scholarly catalog. More important to China society, if we asked him to give a program about the exhibit, he graciously accepted. His last talk that he gave us about an exhibit was Where the Truth Lies, the art of, um, of Choi Ying, and he invited us to a personal guided tour of the exhibit. This was an important exhibit, the first of this great Ming Dynasty artist ever outside of Asia. Three days after he gave half of our group a personal tour of the exhibit, COVID-19 closed the museum. If you remember during those early days of COVID, the COVID lockdown, everyone hoped that the lockdown would only last for a few weeks or so, and that things would reopen. This was not the case. Many of you who had, who had hoped to see the exhibit of Choi Ying would not be able to see it. I was fortunate to see the exhibit and hear Stephen's program to the China Society and attend his guided tour of the exhibit. It was wonderful. I thought it was a shame that more people could not experience what I had exhibited. Had. I wrote Stephen and urged him to make a video of the exhibit. He told me that it was already in the works. If you haven't seen it, I think you should. And I think it's still available on the LACMA website. According to LACMA's description, the current exhibit, Legacies of Ex Exchange, bring together Chinese contemporary art created in response to international trade, political conflict, and global artistic exchange. I have seen the exhibit and know that the art is supposed to spotlight encounters, exchanges, and collisions between China and the West. But I found that the descriptions next to the art were limited to artists, date, and title, and left me without much insight on exchanges, encounters, and collisions. I am not sure what the artist had in mind when he substituted Joe Camel's head for the figures of European classics. There's also a painting of Chairman Mao's head on the left side and the Statue of Liberty on the right side. It is titled Mao in New York. 
I think it, it could also have been titled The Statue of Liberty in Tiananmen Square. That would have really been a collision. Without further ado, I give you Stephen Little, who will set me straight and hopefully give me increased understanding about this outstanding exhibit. Stephen? <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. And uh, thanks for the invitation to, to speak this evening. Uh, and welcome to all of you who are uh, tuned in. I am, uh, let me begin by saying that I'm not a specialist on Chinese contemporary art. Uh, we have a full-time specialist on staff, uh, Susanna Farrell, uh, who, uh, although she's young, under 30, uh, speaks fluent Chinese and knows most of the uh, artists in this show and the next the show that I'll, I'll introduce right after this one. Uh, oh, Susan, Susan gave us the, the talk on the last contemporary Chinese art exhibit. Yes, yes. And it was great. It was really great. Good. Yeah. Well, she's a great presenter and uh, uh, she has a master's degree from the Courtauld Institute in London in contemporary Chinese art. Uh, so she wasn't available tonight, but she will be available to give you a tour in person. I hope that will be possible. Uh, given given the current COVID situation, but uh, the museum is open now, and uh, we will set that up um, probably for October. Um, so I am pinch hitting for her, but I have been involved with both of these collections. I want to start this evening with just a uh, a bit of background about this particular exhibition, which is open now at LACMA: Legacies of Exchange, Chinese Contemporary Art from the Used Collection. It's open for six months, uh, so it will be up until mid-March of next year. Uh, the background for this show is sort of twofold. We, uh, LACMA has a, a, an ongoing partnership with Budi Tech, uh, who is this very important Indonesian Chinese collector of contemporary art who lives in Shanghai, and his foundation, uh, which is based in Hong Kong, his museum, uh, which is in an old aircraft hangar, I think from the 1950s in Shanghai, uh, is a space that he leases from the city of Shanghai and particularly the, what's called the West Bund Redevelopment Agency. Uh, we are already curating exhibitions there. Uh, two years ago, uh, shortly before COVID sort of shut everything down in the US, uh, LACMA created a major show called In Production, which opened at the Hughes Museum in Shanghai uh, I think in November of 2019, and its subject was art created by and inspired by the Hollywood uh, movie studio production system. It was a huge exhibition that has not been shown at LACMA, uh, yet I hope it will be. Uh, it may also go on to uh, be shown uh, somewhere in the, in the Near East. Um, but we have been uh, negotiating a partnership with Booty Tech, who, who is from Jakarta, uh, he is a multimillionaire uh, and he has a, a huge collection owned by his foundation, which numbers over 1000 works of contemporary art, most of it Chinese. And so this exhibition is selected from his foundation's collection. Uh, it was created for LACMA and it is the first exhibition that we've had at LACMA from his collection. So there will be more coming in the future. And the, um, the underlying, I guess, uh, idea uh, in this exhibition is to look at contemporary Chinese artists who are responding to the influx of Western goods uh, and material goods ranging from cigarettes to breakfast cereal to Mercedes Benz cars and Different artists have different, different artists in the exhibition have different takes on the consequences of the, uh, the rise of materialism in China post Deng Xiaoping. Uh, when I first went to China in 1986, uh, there were no foreign cars, no foreign cigarettes. Uh, I remember I spent about a month in China in 1986 doing research on a Ming Dynasty painter about whom I was writing a, a, dis, a PhD dissertation. And I remember very well that at that time, or just before that, there had been a, been a big battle between Coca-Cola and Pepsi, 
with regard to which one would get the franchise in China. There were no foreign soft drinks in China in 1985. And uh, Coke won that battle. And I happened to meet later on the, uh, the vice president of Coca-Cola, a, a gentleman from South Africa named Ian Wilson, um, a very important collector in San Francisco who had sort of made it possible <laughs> through his negotiating techniques with the Chinese government to introduce Coca-Cola. And there, um, the, there was a new marketing campaign uh, that when I first went to China, there were the first big billboards in cities like Beijing and Shanghai and Tianjin uh, in Nanjing for Coca-Cola, which uh, as I'm sure almost all of you know, the, the Chinese name was Coca-Cola, meaning uh, you can drink it and you can be happy which I thought was a really brilliant marketing ploy. That opened the door for hundreds, if not thousands of Western, both American and European non-Chinese uh, goods to come into China. If you go to Beijing to, today or any major city, you'll see shops full of Louis Vuitton and Cartier and you know, Patek Philippe watches, Rolex. That, that none of that was there in the mid eighties when I first went to China. So these artists who are uh, part of this particular exhibition are most of them responding in one way or another to the flood of Western goods and the consequences of that for contemporary Chinese society. Um, and some of the, as we'll see when we, we go into some of the slides in, in a second, um, some of the responses are humorous. Some of them are specifically political. Uh, some of them are um, sort of sounding the alarm about the, the, the rise of consumerism uh, in China. But it is, um, it, it's interesting to see how, how different artists have responded to current events and, and this, this wave of, of material goods in China, which has itself altered Chinese society in, in various ways. So I'm going to just introduce a few of the artists uh, in this show. And let's see if I can, okay, here we go. Probably the most famous artist in the show is Ai Weiwei, uh, who is, I would guess, the best known contemporary Chinese artist uh, in China and outside of China. He is many things. He is a sculptor. He is an installation artist. Um, he is quite brilliant. And in 2011, he created this set of 12 bronze animal heads, which are symbols of the Chinese zodiac. Uh, this is a slide I took in 2000, um, when was it? 2011, uh, the same year in which they were created uh, in London which is where I first encountered the set. This is at the, this is in the old headquarters right on the Thames River in London of the, uh, um, the, China, uh, the, the British Navy, these old 18th century buildings. The building at the far end is now the Courtauld Institute of Art, which is one of the leading art schools, both, uh, both a school of art practice and art history. And this space um, has this gigantic courtyard with fountains in the middle and it was a very dramatic installation. So I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the, the history of this piece. This, this is probably the one work in the show which is not specifically about materialism. This is about things that happened in China in the 18th century during the Qing dynasty. This set, not the set that we have now on display in the exhibition, but a, a different set because the, the artist uh, cast several different sets of these 12 animal heads um, this was a group that was shown at LACMA uh, in late 2011, I think into 2012. These were, the, the heads were installed outdoors around the elevators <laughs> to our parking garage, uh, sort of right in front of Ray's restaurant. And this is the view of the 12 uh, animal heads as they are installed in the exhibition Legacies of Exchange right now at LACMA. Um, Ai Weiwei is very particular about how these heads are installed, uh, whether they are outdoors or indoors. And so we communicated with him, or I should say Susanna Farrell communicated directly with him and his studio. Uh, he wanted the heads in a very specific sequence following the actual sequence of the Chinese Zodiac. 
And um, they aren't usually shown facing each other like this, but he was directly involved in approving and um, consulting on this particular installation. So let me tell you a little bit about what this is about and about the historical background of this piece. In the 18th century, the Qianlong Emperor of the Qing Dynasty, who was the fourth Qing Emperor, he ruled from 1736 until 1795. So he was roughly a contemporary of George Washington, maybe a little older, uh, a Manchu Emperor, uh, was, being, was shown images of the French palace uh, built by Louis XIV at Versailles. Uh, which is, as you know, a very grand complex of buildings with magnificent gardens. And Ch the Chenlong Emperor told these Jesuits who he had invited to work in the Forbidden City, Jesuit priests from Europe who had sent, were sent by the Vatican to China, ostensibly to convert Chinese to Catholicism, uh, in which I would say they largely failed. Uh, but the thing about the Jesuits were, if, you, if you've ever met a Jesuit or know anything about the Society of Jesus, they are exceedingly well educated people. Uh, the, many of the Jesuits who came to China were scientists. They brought with them um, state-of-the-art knowledge of such European sciences as astronomy, hydraulic engineering, uh, cartography or map making, uh, uh, also mathematics, um, the use of the telescope, uh, anatomy, and so as long as they didn't proselytize and talk too much about you know, the Pope or Jesus, they were allowed into the Forbidden City as technical advisors. In fact, at one point, uh, I think even before the Qianlong reign, when the Qing emperors were negotiating the border of China and Russia with the czars of Russia, the, the Jesuit skill at map making was very important in that exercise. They, they were able to, to draw very precise maps of the border of China and Russia, which were used by the Chinese court uh, in their negotiations with the Tsarist government in, in Russia. So the Chenlong Emperor decided that he wanted a version of Versailles. So he commissioned some of the Jesuits who are designers and architects to, to design him a palace complex in Beijing, which came to be known as the Yuan Ming Yuan. Uh, it is known in English as the Old Summer Palace. And this is an etching of one of the buildings. Uh, all of these buildings were later destroyed and I'll tell you how and why that happened. Uh, but they were built probably in the mid 18th century. And this is a scene of one of them which had a fantastic fountain in the foreground. And around the sides of the fountain were cast bronze images of the 12 Chinese zodiac um, animals. So, <clears throat> and you can see them here seated in sort of basically human or anthropomorphic form, but they've got animal heads. Um, the thing, interesting thing that distinguishes the, the Chinese zodiac from the Western zodiac is, is this. The Western zodiac is based on the 12 uh, constellations in which the sun appears to move in each of the 12 months of the year. So the Western zodiac is based on the month uh, that you're born. So I was born in, in May, so I'm a Taurus. And so when I was born, the sun was in or near the constellation of Taurus, which is one of the zodiac anim, uh, uh, constellations in the West. The Chinese zodiac has nothing to do with the sun. It is based on the movement of the planet Jupiter. And by coincidence, Jupiter takes 12 years to orbit the sun. So it's also a 12 animal symbol system. But as I'm sure you know, when the Chinese zodiac is based not on the month that you're born, but the year that you're born. So in China, I am, my symbol is a horse, uh, which I, I like very much. And so the, the, these 12 zodiac animals not only symbolize a cycle of 12 years, but they also symbolize the hours of the day and night. And in traditional China, um, every hour consisted of two of our hours. Uh, so uh, two times 12 is 24. Uh, which corresponds to the number of hours, you know, in, 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 the, uh, in the Western system. Uh, and this fountain and the animals around it, um, the sculptures acted or functioned as a kind of clock. So every two hours, the waters would come out of the mouth of a different animal. 
So it, it, and it was an amazing hydraulic sort of feat that the Jesuits designed. So if you knew which animal corresponded to which two hour period of the day or night, you would get, you could, this functioned as a clock. And it was really a magnificent thing. Um, very sadly, in 1860, the entire site was destroyed during the second opium war when the Chinese uh, rebelled against the British East India Company, which was import growing opium very cheaply in India and flooding China with it. In fact, it got to the point, um, at some point in the 19th century, I've read that almost a third of the Chinese population was addicted to opium, including farmers, peasants, judges. Uh, it didn't matter what social level one was at. Um, and so, because I think a group of diplomats uh, or, and or possibly missionaries from England uh, were murdered during the Second Opium War, the, the English and French governments sent troops from England and France into Beijing and they completely destroyed this palace. So the palace only existed for about a hundred years. Furthermore, uh, some of the troops uh, looted the bronze heads of these animal uh, water spouts. So this is what the fountain looks like today. Uh, you can see it's a, it's a sort of magnificent ruin. It's, I believe, all made of marble. I mean, it had to be an amazing complex. And several of the original animal heads have surfaced onto the art market in the past several years. And by and large, they've all been uh, repatriated to China. I think out of the 12, nine or 10 have been recovered. Um, but um, it, has, it has been a kind of contentious issue because, and an ironic issue that the, uh, this great fountain was designed by Europeans and then destroyed by Europeans. So the whole story has become a kind of symbol of China's uh, rather tormented relationship with the West in the 18th century in particular. Um, and then, you know, looking at today where still we are, we are dealing with, uh, I would say on both sides, both on the West and China, uh, various misconceptions about the other side, a lot of ignorance uh, um, about, about the China on the one hand and the West on the other hand, uh, it's a kind of very organic evolution that's going on in terms of learning, uh, you know, each side learning about the other and, and learning up ways of dealing with ultimately very different cultures. <clears throat> so Ai Weiwei was inspired by the, the strange history of the original fountain and the original animal heads to, to cast his own version of these heads uh, based mostly on the original heads, which he was able to study from photographs, maybe some of them from the originals. His heads are much, much bigger. I mean, well over life size, probably five to six times or more life size. This is him at the foundry where they were cast. As I said earlier, there were multiple sets. I'm not sure how many, I think five or six different sets. He also made a smaller group, uh, a group of smaller sets of, of gold, which I've, I've never seen. Uh, much smaller, probably closer to the size of the original bronze heads back from the 18th century. Um, but this is, let me just go back to the set that's here. Uh, this is the set as it appears now, and it is a very famous work because of the story that underlies it. Um, and as you probably know, a lot of Ai Weiwei's work is political and responds to events in contemporary China. He is constantly a thorn in the side of the Chinese government. He lives and works in London now, so his, his main studio is no longer in China. Um, but it is a magnificent set, and I think a great work because of the, of the story that underlies it, that there's, there's a historical sort of uh, origin to his creating these things. And this particular set uh, is a gift to LACMA from Booty Tech. So we now own this set, uh, which is quite wonderful. So you will get to see this again after the exhibition. I'm not sure, it'll probably be installed outdoors again at some point, uh, but it's, 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 it is the most famous work in the show. So the show opens uh, with this set. But let me look um, and take you uh, to look at some of the other works. Um, it's, there are a lot of works in the show and I'm only going to 
have time to talk about some of them. But this is a work by an artist named Ren Jen, and it is called Stamp Collection. It's a series of, of small acrylic on canvas paintings. It's a set from 1993. So you'll see from this that the works in this show span probably close to 20 years from the early 1990s up until uh, after 2010. And this is a um, this is an interesting, uh, rather different work. It is it has a political dimension. Uh, these are countries around the world that have diplomatic relations with mainland China, and. Um, it, he presents these flags as if they are postage stamps. These, these, these flags don't actually exist in, in this kind of set as postage stamps. So this, this is his uh, creation, uh, sort of imaginary postage stamps. But one of the main uh, messages that he's trying to convey in this work, <clears throat> pardon me, is a desire for different countries to coexist peacefully. And um, I wouldn't say there's, there's a great deal more to this work than that, but it is unusual in that it is not so much critical of current events as hopeful about uh, his desire for countries on the world to work together peacefully, a desire for world peace, uh, which is always seeming very fleeting. And one of the most interesting aspects of this show, which you'll not get in a label or necessarily from a tour, but I will tell you, is that because this collection, uh, the works in this collection came to us from one of Booty Tech's warehouses in China, uh, any show that is done at the Yu's Museum in Shanghai, either from Booty Tech's collection or a show that we send from LACMA to Shanghai, um, has to be approved by uh, Chinese censors. Um, in fact, we can't, we're not able to print any catalog of LACMA exhibitions in China without it being reviewed by censors. So that has, that has caused problems for us once uh, with a map, uh, for example, uh, this is just a footnote unrelated to this exhibition, but we, we did a show some years ago uh, where we had a, it was a show of 17th century Chinese paintings. We had a map of China, which included parts of Korea and Japan and the ocean off of China. And there are these islands, very tiny islands, usually don't appear on any map, that are contested between China and Japan. They are called Diao Yutai in Chinese. And we did not indicate them on the map of China in this one exhibition catalog. And the Chinese printer or the Chinese censors said we could not print the catalog unless we put those islands on the map. Uh, most people don't even know the islands exist. They're uninhabited, <laughs> but it's a classic case. So at the last minute we had to uh, print the catalog in I think either Hong Kong or possibly Singapore, uh, which was cumbersome for us. We had, to, we had to get, you know, all that we had already bought all the paper for the printing of the book and so on. Um, what happened politically with this piece, uh, which was being shipped to, uh, to LACMA from Shanghai, is that one of the flags was the flag of Paraguay, the small uh, South African country. And the Chinese censors refused to let the piece come because Paraguay has diplomatic relations with the Republic of China in Taiwan, not with the People's Republic of China in Beijing. So the one little painting of the Paraguay flag was taken out of this group and then they allowed the piece to come to, to LA. So that is just uh, a little background on the uh, sort of the facts of life of, of dealing in the art world with censors in China. It's usually very straightforward. It's usually, there's usually never an issue. Usually we can imagine what the issue will be before it happens and, and preempt something, but um, you, won't, you won't notice the Paraguay flag missing from the installation, but I'm just telling you, the piece is not quite complete <laughs> as the artist uh, designed it. Now, another very famous artist, Huang Yongping, who sadly died in Paris two years ago, or maybe even last year, um, is this very interesting work, which is all about Hong Kong. Uh, it's called uh, Da Xian, the Doomsday. It's a piece from 1997, which as you will recall, was the year in which Britain returned Hong Kong to China. Uh, Hong Kong having been a um, a colony of Britain since the 1840s, a long time. And 
uh, in sort of commemoration of this event. <coughs> um, and it's, it's, I wouldn't say this is, it's based on political events, but it's, it's actually not, in my opinion, a particularly political work. The artist Huang Yunping, who is known for his installations, um, large scale installations, when he passed away, for example, he was designing a whole new set of subway stations with which were massive installations for, I think, uh, Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, he, he created for this piece a set of huge porcelain teacups with designs on them of uh, specific kinds of Chinese porcelain, which were made for the British East India Company uh, in the 19th century, when they controlled parts of Shanghai and, 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 and uh, Canton or, or Guangdong, Guangzhou in particular, where the English, uh, the British East India Company, which had the monopoly on importing goods from China to England, uh, including tea, including silk, things like this, uh, things that, you know, commodities that were in demand in Europe. Um, they, there was a set of porcelain tea wares made for the British East India Company and the designs on these giant teacups are taken directly from those patterns, which are, you know, real statements about colonialism. I would say that's probably the most political element here. It's a, it's a uh, subtle or not so subtle critique of the whole uh, colonial element in the historical relationship between England and China. And inside the teacups are goods, uh, goods and specifically food items, all of which have the expiration date of the actual date of the turnover, July 1st, 1997. I'm not sure how Huang Yongping got a hold of these now much expired you know, whole wheat flakes and other food items, but they all are stamped with the expiration date, July 1st, 1997, which is the date of the turnover of um, Hong Kong to mainland China. So there's a lot one can read into this. Um, it's, to me, it's sort of not only a statement about the history of that whole colonial exercise of Britain, uh, the dark side of that and you know, whatever might have benefited China through that colonial time, but also um, in, a, in a strange way, a, a kind of celebration of the return of Hong Kong to China. Um, it's a kind of, I would say, multivalent work because you can read positive and negative things into it. Um, and it's certainly a statement about a, uh, a critical aspect of, of history and Chinese uh, relations with, with Europe and with England in particular. Um, but uh, it's one of the most interesting pieces, I think, in the exhibition. Uh, this is an artist I, I am not familiar with, Shi Jin Song. Uh, this is the first time that I've seen his work, but he has created a number of works, in, uh, three works in the exhibition, which take as their point of inspiration logos of Western material goods uh, in this case, particularly Nike uh, shoes, uh, sports shoes, tennis shoes, and in this specific case, the logo of the Mercedes-Benz uh, automobile, which uh, if you have been in China recently, you will notice, you will notice how extremely popular Mercedes-Benz are with Chinese buyers. Um, and what he has done here has, he's made these installation boxes in which he has turned the logos into dangerous weapons. If you'll notice, these Mercedes-Benz limousines have sharp pointed points that, that extend beyond the rim of the logo, uh, almost as if they are weapons that can be thrown through the air. Um, and the Nike, which I don't have a slide of, is, is a cutting blade. That like he calls these pieces blades. This one is called blade number two. These are from 2003, so uh, 18 years ago. But they are a very interesting take on the uh, what this artist perceives as the menacing element of these Western commodities that are coming into China. Uh, that they are not in themselves menacing, but the uh, the desire for them, the addiction for them, the the fact that just as in America, these these and in Europe, uh, 
these commodities like Mercedes Benz, automobiles and Nike shoes are very powerful status symbols and have become very powerful status symbols in Chinese society today. I think that's what these pieces are about. These are both a warning and an observation of the danger, uh, the danger to perhaps traditional Chinese culture in this massive uh, importation of Western goods. But I, I, I'm particularly fond of these works. I think they're, they're quite clever, they're subtle. Uh, the, the element of the chains in them is, uh, you know, perhaps a not so subtle uh, hint at, at addiction or slavery um, in, in being enslaved by a desire for these Western goods. I think they're particularly beautiful and, and well-made. Uh, one of the works in the exhibition is a gigantic photograph by this artist, Shu Guo Rei, who is a very interesting photographer. This is a photograph of the famous Bird's Nest Stadium that was designed for the uh, Olympic Games when they were held in 2008 in Beijing. And this shows the site under construction. This was partly designed by a Western architectural firm working in conjunction with Ai Weiwei. So uh, Ai Weiwei, who was still working in Beijing with his studio there, was directly involved in the design of this great stadium. And Shu Guo Rei is interesting because he uses very old fashioned uh, camera equipment. He uses a giant pinhole camera, like a giant wooden box with a pinhole and the film, uh, oversized uh, actual film. This is a negative, it's a gelatin silver print, but this is a negative image. And most of his images are negatives. <coughs> Uh, enormous in scale, I'd say uh, at least nine or 10 feet across. He, he prints his images on a gigantic scale. I'll show you, I think um, there, yeah, there's another photograph by him, which is in the second exhibition I'll talk about, which opens in September. Uh, I'm going to finish talking about this exhibition uh, about the, the artist Xu Bing who is also, I'd say, one of the top three or four most famous contemporary artists in China. He's, um, I say, in my opinion, one of a great genius. Um, and he has been involved uh, in, for many years in a project called the Tobacco Project, uh, which I think was inspired not only by the massive importation of, of Western cigarettes into China, but also the fact that Xu Bing's father died from lung cancer from smoking cigarettes. So the whole, the whole image uh, and reality of tobacco is something that for Xu Bing is very personal. And uh, when we did the show Allure of Matter two years ago, which was uh, curated by Professor Wu Hong at the University of Chicago, one of the great uh, scholars of contemporary Chinese art and a great curator also, there was a giant, if any of you saw that show, you will may remember the giant tiger skin carpet made entirely of um, tens of thousands of, of cigarettes. Um, and that was a project that took him many years to realize. This project, um, The Language of Smoke, is an unusual installation from 2004. This is shown as it was installed in Shanghai. <coughs> and it's really hard to see here, but each of the, it's made of uh, a series of, of uh, neon lights, which uh, have a bunch of uh, Chinese characters. Um, and I'm going to read you, it's a, it's a kind of, um, these ca Chinese characters, which are enveloped in, in, uh, in, in a kind of mist or smoke, which can be made in different ways. The original had dry ice, um, and so uh, the characters are surrounded by smoke. We, we have this piece in the show. Uh, it's been closed. This individual piece has been closed since the show opened because uh, unfortunately Xu Bing did not send us any instructions for how to do this. And it requires a great deal of electricity and the, uh, the transformers which were sent over. And I should mention this piece, as far as I know had only been installed once in 2004. Uh, the transformers were sort of designed for the Chinese electrical system, which has different voltage. And we had to, we could not get it to work. We had to rip it all out, hire uh, a high-end company to redesign the electrical system, and that's still ongoing. So I'm hoping by mid-September, 
that uh, this, sh this will be open. So I'm showing you the Shanghai version, but I wanted to uh, just point out that from this kind of nebulous haze of dry ice, mist and smoke, uh, the, the neon char Chinese characters that, that are emerged um, are from a 1902 advertisement for uh, a British American tobacco company that was operating in China at the end of the Qing dynasty. And uh, I don't have the Chinese characters here right in front of me, but I'm going to read you now an English translation of this advertising uh, uh, sort of short, short text. Um, this, the invention of smoke or smoking, the most convenient and satisfying new method of manufacturing cigarettes, machine made, neat, pure, and the most hygienic. So this sort of classic tobacco advertising, you know, early on, uh, it's interesting, uh, the, one of the biggest tobacco companies in the US uh, was founded by a man named James Duke who was the father of Doris Duke, uh, who is a great collector, philanthropist, um, who had homes in LA and New York, uh, New Jersey and Honolulu. Um, when James Duke brought over the first cigarette rolling machine to, be, to mass produce cigarettes at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, he strictly forbade uh, anyone in his family and especially the women from smoking cigarettes as he made millions of dollars using this new cigarette rolling machine. <clears throat> so Xu Bing is very conscious of the, the dark side of cigarette smoking. Um, and he, his, his tobacco project, which has now lasted well over 10 years and has had different kinds of iterations um, is, is a continuous theme in his work. And uh, this is, a, I think, a particularly interesting work because it does refer to uh, early Western advertising for cigarettes in, Ch in China. Um, so that's the end of my little uh, teaser for legacies of exchange. Uh, and as I think you can see the artists represented in the show and the few that I've sort of highlighted this evening um, have very different takes on the the, the, the introduction of Western material goods into China and the, in, the impact of that, both the desire and the dangers of various kinds of, of Western goods and the, um, you know, if anything, it's, it's not slowing down. So I think in many ways, this exhibition is quite relevant to today, uh, not just to China, but the West's relationship with China. I'd like to end by giving you a brief introduction to the next big exhibition of contemporary, mostly contemporary Chinese art. I should say, uh, mostly contemporary, mostly Chinese art. Uh, a show which opens on September 19th and will run for three months until mid-December of this year, Ink Dreams, selections from the Fondation Ink Collection. And that is not a, that's not a typo. This is the French spelling of the word foundation. Um, this show, which is also being curated by uh, Susanna Farrell, uh, will have a very beautiful catalog. And let me give you just a little bit of background. <clears throat> the, uh, let's see, the 81 works in the exhibition are selected from a large collection of 400 mostly contemporary Chinese ink paintings, which are a promised gift to LACMA from a a uh, very wonderful uh, French couple named Gerard and Dora Cogne, who live in Geneva, in Switzerland. Over the past 20 years, the Cognes have, have created a vast collection of 400 works of art, all of which they are giving to LACMA as a gift. This is the most significant gift of contemporary Chinese art in LACMA's history. Uh, it will make LACMA the biggest museum collection of Chinese ink paintings in the United States. Uh, it is an extraordinarily great collection. The, the Konyas have amazing taste. And in almost every case, they have bought uh, either one or more works from the actual artists from their, their studios in China. One thing that's interesting before I give you um, a preview of, of the collection and the show, the, the, by the way, I should mention that the, about 80% of the works in the show are Chinese. 
Um, but the, there's a kind of global um, a, a interest running through the, the, the collection. Um, and although the Cognes formed the collection, they have now given the collection to a, to a foundation. They formed a, a, a foundation in Geneva, in Switzerland, uh, called the Fondation Inc, or the Foundation Inc, if it were in English, um, so that they could get a tax write-off by their charitable gift to LACMA. They were not going to be able to get a tax deduction uh, from the Swiss IRS just if they gave the collection to LACMA personally, but if they gave it to a foundation and the foundation made the gift, then they could, by extension, get the tax deduction. So that, that took a little while, but... Uh, the entire collection is coming to LACMA by the end of 2023. So uh, about two years from now, about two and a half years away. Uh, any works that come to us now will stay with us. Uh, we have a contractual agreement with the, the Fondation Inc. Uh, and in exchange for the gift, we will be publishing a series of catalogs over time of the entire collection. Uh, and it is truly a magnificent uh, collection. I should mention also, and this will not be in any of the PR material that we put out, that the Cognes who created this collection, and I should say they're still collecting, which is wonderful for us. Um, the Cognes were in discussions even before they started talking to LACMA with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, with the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, with the university museums at Princeton and Stanford, and the great collection of contemporary art that will soon be opening in Hong Kong called M Plus, which is funded by the Hong Kong government. Um, and by chance, I was introduced to Mr. Konye at Art Basel Hong Kong in 2017. And uh, I was told by some of his advisors, some of his curate, some of the curators that he was looking for a home for this collection of 400 works and that I should make a pitch. And I met him and then wrote to him a long letter in which I told him that if he, get, if, the, if he and his wife gave the collection to LACMA, that we would not only publish the entire collection, uh, but that we would uh, uh, plan a series of exhibitions of the collection, which we are doing. And also, and most importantly, that we would use the collection for teaching. Uh, and we have made it a point uh, for any of, the, any of the universities in greater Los Angeles, um, and, and I would say in Southern California that have programs in Chinese art history. And there are seven right off the top of my head that I can think of uh, that have, for example, uh, professors with PhDs in Chinese art teaching Chinese art history. Um, and those include UCLA, USC, uh, Occidental College, um, UC Irvine, UC Riverside, UC Santa Barbara, and UC San Diego. They all have programs, both undergraduate and mostly they have graduate programs in Chinese art history. So there's this big critical mass of students in Southern California, which most people would not expect. I mean, one, you might expect that New York or Chicago or San Francisco might have a bigger number of students uh, studying Chinese art history, but in fact, Los Angeles has the biggest one. By, by chance. So um, I told Mr. Konya and his wife, Dora, that if they gave the collection to LACMA, that we would make this collection available to any student or class anytime they wanted to come see the collection. Um, and that, that was what turned the wheel. And two weeks after I sent that letter, they gave the whole, they made the decision to give the entire collection to LACMA. Um, and it, I will say it's odd to me that none of the other museums they were talking to uh, or discussing as possible venues for their collection thought to, to suggest that their collections could be used for teaching. But this is a big part of our program. And I think it, it, it clearly facilitates getting gifts. Um, I should mention that also the collection includes ink paintings and, and I, um, from artists in Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Singapore, Europe, and one American artist. Uh, about 20% of the collection is photography, and I'll show you a few examples of that. So it's really a global collection, but 80% of it is Chinese, and the entire collection is inspired by the long tradition in China of ink painting, 
And um, it is truly an extraordinary collection. I mean, mostly monochromatic. There are some images where the artists are using color. I'll show you um, one example of that. But let me just show you a few of the slides. Now, what I'm showing you, some of this will be in the exhibition that opens on September 19th. Uh, and again, the exhibition is called Ink Dreams. Um, some of these are just things that are in the collection, um, but this, this will be in the exhibition. This is by uh, a wonderful Chinese ink painter named Liu Dan, who is from Nanjing. Uh, he now has his studio in Beijing. He is, I'd say, one of the top 10 ink painters, contemporary ink painters in China today. I was very lucky to meet Liu Dan when he was uh, unknown and living, uh, he married an American student at Nanjing University back in the uh, mid eighties, uh, a woman who uh, later became a professor of Chinese theater at University of Hawaii uh, named Elizabeth Wickman. Um, she still runs the Chinese theater uh, program at the University of Hawaii and her specialty is Peking opera. And she was such a star in China in the 80s that if she was in full makeup in a Peking opera singing that falsetto sound of the female voices, nobody could tell she was a, an American. She looked completely and acted completely as a classic Peking opera star or Beijing opera. So Liu Dan married her, moved to Hawaii with her. I met Liu Dan in 1989. So long time ago, and he was already developing this style, which is clearly based on traditional techniques and philosophy of, of traditional ink painting, landscape painting, but unambiguously uh, contemporary at the same time. He is, he's like a monk. Uh, he and his American wife split up uh, some time ago in the 90s. He's now back in Beijing. His current wife is Chinese. Uh, she, they met in New York because she was a translator at the United Nations. Uh, but he is a really interesting painter and someday um, we are planning to do a big show of his work at LACMA. He works very, very slowly. And there's a long line of clients waiting for his paintings. He, he can take two or three years to finish one painting like this. Um, he was recently invited by the Palace Museum in the Forbidden City in Beijing to create a painting for them. It is now on display in their main guest VIP reception hall. Uh, but this is a, a wonderful painting which uh, Mr. Konye commissioned and this is, will be in the show and this will become part of LACMA's collection. Um, another very, one of my favorite contemporary Chinese ink painters, Zheng Chongbin is from Shanghai. Uh, in the late eighties, he got a scholarship to study at the San Francisco uh, Academy of Fine Arts. And he has lived since that time in San Francisco. His studio is now in Marin County, but he is one of the leading contemporary ink painters in, uh, from China. <clears throat> and this is a work from 2011 in which he has combined uh, traditional ink with a white acrylic paint to create these uh, completely abstract, very gestural uh, ink paintings. He has also become a, a really interesting video artist. We are, I'm happy to say Lachman now owns three of his videos, um, including one from the Fondation Ink Collection. The other two have been given by private individuals uh, who met him, uh, who have uh, been very impressed with his work. He works on a very large scale and his works are constantly changing. This work is uh, already 10 years old. Um, but this will be in the exhibition. Interestingly, a, a significant portion, a small portion, but an important part of this uh, Fondation Ink Collection comprises calligraphy. And this is one of my favorite works of calligraphy uh, in the collection by a, uh, an artist who's now in his 70s, Wang Dongling, born in 1945. Uh, he is a professor at the China Academy of Fine Arts in Hangzhou in Zhejiang province, which I would say after the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing is uh, the second most important and really fine art academy in China. And this is Wang Dongling's very wild cursive script transcription of the Heart Sutra or the Xinjing, which is the shortest of all Buddhist texts. 
Uh, in English, it fits uh, on one page very easily. It's a favorite text for Chinese calligraphers going back probably to the Song Dynasty because it's short, it's easy to memorize. It's something a, a great calligrapher can, can write out from memory. Um, and this is a good example of that. It's, it's the entire text of the sutra, which incidentally uh, is also a fascinating text if you read it. You can Google it, the Heart Sutra, and you can get, you know, there are numerous English translations of it, but it's a very interesting text because it is about the fundamental nature of reality itself. Uh, and as you probably know from a Buddhist point of view, uh, reality is, is highly illusory. In other words, there is no one reality. Uh, and the very existence of things themselves, um, the Buddha himself constantly reiterated that, that reality is, in many ways, an illusion created by the human mind. Um, and if you've studied uh, contemporary physics, you will know that uh, how illusory existence can be or reality can be. I mean, uh, I'm, I've got my computer here on a table. Um, and, you know, to me, the table looks very solid. It's made of wood, and if I smash my head on it, I will be injured. But that does not change the fact that the table itself is mostly empty space. That if you break it down to the very atoms, each atom itself, its nucleus, its protons and neutrons and the electrons that orbit that's that nucleus, the space that that takes up is mostly empty. And it's not the, it's the, uh, it's the alignment of the atoms uh, that makes things seem solid when they're not. But we can't perceive that, that emptiness, even though it's there. Uh, that's what the Heart Sutra is all about. It's a really interesting text. I, I highly recommend it. You'll get some great insight into Buddhism, uh, reading either the, the Heart Sutra in Chinese or in, uh, uh, or in English. But this is a beautiful work. I'm, I'm really fond of Wang Dongling's work. He is also, as you know, uh, Chinese calligraphy is very much a performance art. I, I've been at, at banquets in China where there'll be one or two great calligraphers present. I was once uh, at a banquet where C.C. C. Wong, the great painter who lived in New York, uh, was present. And he was a very superb calligrapher. And after the banquet, people brought out paper and brushes and ink and invited him to do calligraphy. And he, he created you know eight or 10 different works of calligraphy right on the spot. Um, that aspect of, of calligraphy as a performance, as a kind of dance done in real time is still very present in China. And it, it, that's got a long, long history. Um, and, and Wang Dongli uh, has been known to come to exhibitions in the United States um, and do calligraphic performances, often with a huge brush uh, as big as a broom on huge sheets of paper, which is a fantastic thing. This is a big work, but it's done with, I think, uh, just a large, normal calligraphy brush. Li Jin is represented in the collection. He is a very unusual painter from Tianjin. Um, he uh, is a figure painter. He, is, he works usually in color <clears throat> and his work is becoming better known. Uh, this is a detail from a long hand scroll in the uh, in the collection that's coming to us. Uh, this I believe is in the exhibition um, he is, um, he's, he's very, he's an interesting artist. He's, he's not beyond making social, social commentaries in his work. This painting includes self portraits of him in many manifestations. He is an obsessed foodie. Uh, so his paintings are always full of food, uh, both raw and cooked. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a gourmet chef himself. Uh, Sotheby's two or three years ago paid for him to spend a month in the U.S. doing a road trip from uh, L.A. to New York uh, on the condition that he would do a series of paintings of the food that he encountered across the United States. And uh, those were put up for sale at Sotheby's. In fact, Sotheby's in L.A. had a, a show of his paintings at the end of his trip uh, for a couple of weeks, uh, two or three years ago. Uh, this is the one American artist in the show. Michael Cherney has lived in Beijing for many, many years. Uh, his wife is Chinese. They have a beautiful daughter. Um, he is a photographer, but his specialty uh, is landscapes, landscape photography, which he does in black and white. 
And the, uh, this is unusual, this work, uh, which is a detail of the, the mouth of a Buddhist sculpture, probably from the Sixth Dynasties period, uh, which he encountered in China. But he's known for doing series of landscape photog photographs, which are then mounted as Chinese hanging scrolls. So the work in the exhibition, it will be not this work, but will be a series of photographs he took of the five sacred peaks in China, which uh, are located in the very center, Mount Sung, and then the great mountain in the east in Shandong, Mount Tai, uh, the mountain in uh, Shanxi province near Xi'an, uh, Mount Hua, and then uh, the mountains in Shanxi in the north, and I think in Hunan in the south, both called Hua Shan, or Hangshan, I'm sorry, but with different characters. Uh, so that's a set of five hanging scrolls of the five sacred peaks will be the exhibition. He's an amazing artist. He's, he has become quite famous in China uh, and increasingly is collected by Western museums. So the, the, the Konya has collected a number of works of his which are now all coming to us. And then I'm going to finish with this work which is by uh, a remarkable artist named Idris Khan who is uh, British, born in, grew up in London, works in London, but is of Pakistani descent. Actually, his, uh, his father is originally Pakistani. His mother, I think, is English. Um, and he, his mother is a musician. And Idris Khan, who is now um, a, a very famous artist in Europe, works both in photography and uh, in, in painting. And this is a work which in, in which he has superimposed a number of photographs on which he has also done drawings. And it's a large work um, and it's also monochromatic. Uh, I wouldn't say that he is specifically inspired by Chinese ink painting or its tradition, but he is, uh, almost all of his work is in various shades of gray or black or white and uh, very musical in its movement. Um, you can tell that he is someone who grew up with listening to classical music a lot. Um, and we are really thrilled to get to have two works by Idris Khan in the Fondation Inc. collection. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, just will mention that in uh, 2023, we will have another exhibition from this Fondation Inc. collection just on Chinese calligraphy in its contemporary manifestations. So we are planning a whole series of exhibitions going into the future. Uh, it will take probably years and years to show the entire 400 works in the Fondation Inc. collection. But this is, uh, as I said, it, this is one of the most important gifts of, of contemporary Chinese art to any American museum. And we are really thrilled and honored um, that the Konya selected LACMA. Um, so, and we will be traveling the show that opens in September also. It, it will probably go, we have interest both in Macau and in Qatar in the Near East uh, already to date. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you very much. I would be delighted to answer any questions that you might have. And if there are no questions, that's okay too. Well, uh, there's actually only one question comment right now. So if any of you have any questions, please put them in the chat to me. Uh, but this one's from Jan Lee Wong. Uh, and they say, is Stephen aware of another exchange of fresco art and home construction in rural villages in Taishan, Guangdong, China? These Euro-American style fresco art with Chinese themes can be found above the doorways of brick homes in these villages. Laura Ng, Stanford PhD student, discovered these in her transnational research. Uh, thank you. I am not aware of this, although I think I have heard about it uh, somewhere online, maybe a couple of months ago, but I will, uh, I will certainly follow up. It sounds very interesting and worthwhile. So thank you. Let's see, other than that, <laughs> unless anyone adds anything more to me, no one else is. Well, yeah, yeah, I have a question and it's a question that I brought up earlier and it's a question of titles and censorship. There was that one painting that has German Mao's um, head 
next to the Statue of Liberty and it's titled Mao in New York. What, what was his idea behind it? I mean, like I say, I, I would think you could have said Statue of Liberty in Tiananmen Square and it would have, it, I mean, it would have really created a real collision. Yes. Um, I will, I have to be honest, I am not familiar with the backstory on that work. Um, and so you will have to ask uh, Susanna Farrell. Uh, but what I can read you is the, um, uh, just based on the, the label that I, I got online for, that, for this work in that show, um, I think there are several, I'm guessing, and I'm speculating here that there are several things going on. I think, you know, images of Chairman Mao have gone through their own interesting history in, in China, within China, since he, since he passed away. Um, he died, I think, in 1976. I first went to China in 1986, 10 years later. And um, most people I met in China had no interest in Mao. They had lost interest in him. They, they were... Um, they were well aware of a lot of the suffering that he had caused or his policies had caused. Um, but there's, after, in the 1990s, um, you started to see images of Mao uh, often uh, depicted in a kind of pop art way as if he was an icon, um, again, multivalent, positive and negative. I mean, he's widely known as someone who, who unified China after, sec after the Second World War, after the Civil War with Chiang Kai-shek, uh, for better or for worse, given his policies. Um, but certainly the father of modern mainland China, without any question. And his reputation has undergone a kind of refurbishment by the Communist Party. Um, although he's often you know, presented, even in the great portrait of him that hangs on uh, Tiananmen at the northern end of Tiananmen Square. It's, it's, he's now shown as a kind of uh, grandfatherly figure. Uh, the, the whole tone of that portrait has radically changed since the 70s or late 60s during the Cultural Revolution. It, just the expression on his face, it's really interesting to look at the, the changes year by year as, as the, the Communist Party sort of grapples with how to present Chairman Mao, the image of Chairman Mao, and what does that, what does that signify? But I think he has been often um, contrasted in paintings by contemporary Chinese artists with uh, not only Western goods, but also Western kinds of imagery. And I mean, it's, it's quite a political statement to, to present an image of Chairman Mao with the Statue of Liberty. Um, depending on the year, it might be seen as very dangerous, very subversive. Uh, I, I don't, I, ha I didn't, I haven't heard that there was any outcry or criticism by the Chinese censor. So I'm suspecting that there's enough of that kind of, uh, you know, appropriation of Chairman Mao's, Mao's image going on in mainland China right now by multiple artists, that it is not considered a big political problem. Um, but it is certainly a political statement, uh, given that a version of the Statue of Liberty was created during the Tiananmen or before the Tiananmen incident in 1989 as a desire for freedom, for political freedom in China, and that that was destroyed when that whole movement was put down rather, rather uh, you know, violently. Um, so I, without being able to answer your question, which is a good question, a legitimate question, uh, save that for Susanna Farrell when you see her. Uh, I will give her a heads up to be prepared for your question, because there are there. It's a it, it's a it's a complicated image, and I think the there are multiple answers to the question of what what prompted uh, the artist Yu Johan to do that. Um, and that that image is now, um, you know, soon will be twenty years old too. That painting was done in nineteen ninety five. Uh, possibly in rather different circumstances than, than the artist. And I don't know what the artist is doing now. So I'm, this just reflects my own ignorance. But it's a good question. Thank you. I think the other question I have is, why did there's that series of paintings with the camel's head? Yes. 
and and what what is the what's behind that? Um, that I think is all about cigarettes. Um, and you know the it the, that camel being a a symbol of camel cigarettes. Um, the artist has done a whole series of, of paintings in which he takes a very famous Western old master. And, you know, uh, originally that, that particular image that's in the show, the original had the head of Venus and she's accompanied by Cupid. Uh, and by sticking Joe Camel's head on that painting, it sort of turns the whole thrust of the original painting, which is about the goddess of love in Greek mythology uh, Greek and Roman mythology into a uh, into an image of consumerism of um, uh, the the popularity of Western cigarettes in China, um, but that's again I I, I will I will I have to defer to Susanna to get into more detail. But thank you know don't don't hold back from asking her these questions because because they they need. They need explaining, um, and you know, I myself clearly not an expert uh, in contemporary Chinese art. I'm my my head is stuck in the 15th and 16th century. I mostly do Ming Dynasty, so uh, I'm a, I'm a student here also. But thanks for the question. Uh, I think the thing that we should also announce is that LACMA is having a Zoom program on September 8th. Um, it's going to be a um, conversation, I guess, between S Suzanne and uh, one of the artists. And um, uh, that the one piece of art that he has at the exhibit is really kind of thought provoking. I, I wasn't quite sure what it was, but, you know, it's, it's um, I mean, I described it as, um, an ape in a cage sitting on a toilet, but he wasn't sitting on a toilet. It looks like he's going down the toilet. And he has a pistol. He has the um, origins of the species. And he has, I think it was a Bible in Chinese. Yes. And it's a complicated work. It, there, there are many things going on there. Um, on one level, it's a play on a very famous painting by the French artist, um, Jean, I think Jean-Louis David. I forget, I forget it, I may be butchering his first name, but David was a painter who worked both for the aristocracy before the French Revolution and worked during and after the French Revolution. Um, and one of his most famous paintings is called The Death of Marat, which is, shows the, uh, the dead body of a French revolutionary who had been stabbed by a woman while he was taking his bath. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, the, the image of the monkey who is, who is, I think, technically meant to be dead in this cage um, is inspired by that painting. But on, on the most superficial level, I can say it's a painting about the dangers of revolutions, uh, the, the violence that revolutions can entail. Um, but it's also on a deeper level, uh, it's about human evolution. And it's about, you know, by putting a, a Bible and Charles Darwin's uh, book on the evolution of the species together, I think the Chinese, this Chinese artist is, is um, uh, very directly asked, you know, sort of raising the question of, of Darwinism as a revolutionary school of thought uh, and the, the impact of that whole, that whole sort of uh, struggle between the church, the Christian church and Darwin and what, and you know, how we're still very much dealing with that issue today, certainly in America, <laughs> whether to what degree that's an issue in China, I don't know. Um, but that's, uh, that's as far as I'm able to go with it. <laughs> well, I, I think that that program is going to be very thought provoking and uh, one of the reasons why I had this program being so early was that we would have at least some background on the exhibit before that program came. came. And I, I think, I hope, I encourage all of our attendees here to 
to go to the, uh, to register for that program and and to attend it. Please do. I think um, you'll you'll be listening to someone who's a real expert and uh, in in conversation with a. Uh, um, uh, a leading contemporary Chinese artist who works uh, in a wide variety of, of mediums. So do look forward to that. And thank you again for the invitation to speak this evening. Well, I think all of us enjoyed it. And I think we, we learned a lot more than just art. <laughs> I, I think, and um, I, I'm really, so pleased that you were able to to come. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And see you next time. Uh, well, if there aren't any more questions, I think um, I look forward to seeing you people for our next program. Hopefully it will be uh, Suzanne uh, Farrell's talk on this special exhibit on ink. So, until then, good night and be safe. Thank you, good night. <laughs>